Jonah Gagwa is my name. I serve as one of the pastors here at Mumlaka Hill Chapel. I am married. Do not be deceived by my size. I've actually gained two kg since I, since I got married. So you should have seen me before. <laughs> and I also uh, have the wonderful opportunity to, uh, to be a father to one lovely daughter. I actually asked uh, my wife to put her on screen when I go on stage so that I can say, Sasa, Sasa. <laughs> ah, goodness. Love that bundle of joy. I trust that you have been well and that God has been good and kind to you. Um, I have the great honor and privilege of bringing God's word to us today. So without further ado, would you turn with me to the book of Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. I'll read two verses, uh, verse 1 and verse 8. You do well to read the whole chapter. Isaiah is in the Old Testament. If you are anywhere past Matthew, you are lost. Chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a high and lofty throne. And his robe filled the temple. Verse 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who should I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. Our Lord, we are grateful for your word. Would you by it instruct our hearts? In the name of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus. Amen. If this gathering is representative of the national election results, as has been recently released by the IEBC, then it would mean that 35.23% of us were eligible to vote but did not. It would mean that 32% of us, 044 voted for Deputy President Ruto. It would mean that 31.39% of us voted voted for former Prime Minister Raila. It would mean that 0.28% of us voted for Professor Wajakoya. The pastors are requesting a meeting after the service with that group. If you are not available, there's a prayer corner on this <laughs> end. And also it would mean that 0.14% of us voted for Bishop Moore. Now, in case I know that we are in a season that uh, percentages are a big deal, <laughs> if there is any error with these percentages, I just want to point out that it was the Pathway Intern Kemboy that did the math. <laughs> So should you have any errors, please address them to him. But it is likely that in this congregation there would be some that are elated, uh, hopeful concerning the results. Perhaps others just are feeling of, yeah, meh. And others perhaps uh, feeling of great sadness or heart um, or disappointment. Our nation, in many ways today, is a divided nation. There is all these emotions that we've mentioned. But perhaps, if we are being honest, there seems to be a looming anxiety on most, if not all of us, about how will it all turn out. I'm persuaded that our passage speaks to us amidst this very situation. Consider the first Verse, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. Now, if I was a preacher in some of the, use a kind word, interesting churches around us, I would have started this sermon with uh, something like this. 
the scripture says that in the year that King Uzziah died, Uzziah, Isaiah saw the Lord. Then I would have asked you this question. What must die in your life <laughs> for you to see the Lord? But because I am not those kinds of preachers, I will not say that. However, I will bring to our attention that Isaiah does begin this text in an, a bit of an unusual way. Because prophets always dated events by the reign of the king and the year of the reign of the king, not by the death of the king. If you search out throughout all of scripture, you will find that it is only Isaiah that ever dates an event by the death of the king. In Ezra chapter 6, verse 3, for example, we'll see that um, Ezra dates it like this says, in the first year of the king Cyrus. Now what you will note here is this, that whatever it was, whatever the year it was that Uzziah died, that would have been the same year that the next king reigned. So the last, um, the year that king Uzziah died would have been also the first year of the reign of the king Jotham. How come Isaiah doesn't say that? How come he doesn't say, because Uzziah, read, um, Uzziah led for 52 years, he doesn't say in the 52nd year of the reign of Uzziah, and he doesn't say in the first year of the reign of Jotham, even though both would have been correct. He chooses rather to bring attention to the death of Uzziah. Because Isaiah is not just interested in dating this particular event. Isaiah wants to give you and I a little bit of a context upon which he saw the vision that he saw. You see, Uzziah had ruled Judah for more than half a century, 52 years. Can you imagine having a president for 52 years? Now, in Africa, we don't need to imagine too much. Um, <laughs> This is a problem for the people in the West. Here we are ready for, for anything. If we didn't know about Israel's political structure, we would have wanted to test Uzziah for African DNA. But Uzziah had been a great king. He had been an efficient administrator and an able military leader. Under his leadership, Judah had grown in every way. You will see his story in 2 Chronicles chapter 26 from verse 1 to 15. He had been a great king. In fact, this is God's summary. This is God's summary of Isaiah's rule. 2 Chronicles chapter 26 verse 4. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father Amaziah had done. Uzziah had been a great king, but as is the temptation of many who accomplish much and do great things, towards his latter years, he became proud. He became proud and entered into the temple of God, demanded to offer sacrifice contrary to the law of God, a position that was only allowed for the priests. And because of that, he was struck in judgment. Leprosy broke out on him, he was forced into self-isolation, and he would live and lead the rest of his life in leprosy. You see, in democratic societies like ours, presidents rule until their constitutional term is over. However, in monarchical societies, monarchical societies, monarchy, mona? in societies where kings rule, they rule till they die. Whereas in a democrat democratic society, the end of the term is necessi necessitates a transition of power. A transition of power is only necessitated in Israel by the death of a king. And so you can see that in many ways, Isaiah saw his vision in a term much similar to ours. They were in the middle of a transition of power. But you and I wouldn't find it too hard to imagine that if an incumbent president died in office, that would be a crisis. There would be a sense of hopelessness, a sense of what happens next, a sense of anxiety. From sheer demographics, I can tell that not many of us were alive when the first uh, founder of the 
of our republic died. But I can imagine, I've heard stories. Reverend Munala has told me those stories. <laughs> there was a sense of anxiety and hopelessness. See, the truth is this. There is hardly any one of us here in this room that cannot relate with the kind of crisis that this transition of power would, would, would present. Will the next king rule as well as the last king? Will there be a civil war of some sorts if the brothers and the sons of the king begin to fight in order to, to ascend the throne? And perhaps it wouldn't be unlikely that there would have been two categories of people, at least in Israel at the time. Those who appreciated the rule of Uzziah might have been a little relieved that finally, might have been sad that, oh my goodness, he was a great king. I didn't want his reign to end. Will the next king live up to his legacy? But obviously it is true that there is no human being or leader that has ever been loved by any, everyone. I assume that it would have been the same in the days of Uzziah. There would have been others who might have felt or thought, hmm, finally, we have been waiting. At least now we'll give Jotham room to, to flourish and to lead this country into the right direction. You see, in fact, what makes this time actually even of greater crisis is that by the time Uzziah was dying, the great military leader, Assyria was becoming, uh, uh, re-emerging as a, as a superpower of the day, and they had begun to conquer lands, and they were slowly going towards Judah. And maybe there was a sense in which the people felt, at least, yeah, we've heard about Assyria and we've heard that they are encroaching and expanding their territory, but as long as Uzziah lives, we will be safe. And then Uzziah dies. You see, the reality in our country today is that whoever, depending on how the court battles goes and whoever will eventually be sworn in as president of our republic, is that they are not taking this country from a very good place, right? There is high levels of corruption, almost as though it's been normalized in our country. We are no longer shocked when we hear billions are lost. There is high debt. My dear daughter has been born with a crazy debt on her head. Right? Just high national debt. The high cost of living, fuel prices are on their all-time high. And perhaps you're here and you feel happy, rejoicing, because you believe that your candidate who won is able to deal with these issues. And maybe you're here and you're feeling a little maybe disappointed or hurt because your candidate who lost, you felt, was the better person to lead the country through these uh, issues that we are in. You see, Isaiah particularly would have been well acquainted with, with Uzziah because Isaiah, according to First Chronic, uh, Second Chronicles 22, is the one who documented the reign of Uzziah. And so Isaiah, like many of us today, went into the temple of God feeling the weight of the crisis in the nation and the anxiety and the tension, seeking an answer from God to see what is God saying about my nation. And Isaiah speaks to us and draws us into his experience. He says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. As I said, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne. If you consider the crisis that is looming in Judah... I'd like us to note what is not happening. When God opens the curtain for Isaiah to see what's happening in heaven, it is just as of much importance as it is what's, what's happening as to what is not happening. He says, I saw the Lord. And you might have expected him to say maybe something like, I saw the Lord pacing the floor, wondering what next to be done. Or perhaps I saw the Lord seated with his hand on his chin in deep thought. 
Or perhaps I saw the Lord trying to lobby for position to finally get his man on the throne. No. Isaiah says, I saw the Lord seated on his throne. Whereas the throne on earth in Judah was empty, whereas there was a concern about the transition of power, God opens up the curtains and Isaiah sees that there is no transition of power in heaven and the throne in heaven is occupied by he who sits on the throne. He wasn't lying under the throne. He had not been knocked off the throne. He was still in charge. Now this language of a throne is more than a seat. Oftentimes we think that when you say the king, has, you know, the, the king is seated on his throne, it's not just a seat. Because after all, if the king wakes up from that throne and decides to go take a glass of water, does he cease to be on the throne? He is still on the throne. And so when the Bible uses that language, he's saying that what Isaiah saw is that the rightful ruler of the universe is still in control and in charge. Despite the looming crisis, despite the tension in the land, the seat in heaven is occupied. And he realizes and he sees that if you read from verse 2, the angels of God are still attending to him. They are covering their eyes, they are covering their feet, they are serving him with their hands. God is still in charge. And he begins to say, and it's so wonderful for me, if you, if, you, if, it, if you allow yourself to be drawn into Isaiah's vision, it's almost as though as soon as he begins to describe it. Because notice what he says. He says, I saw him high and lifted up and the train of his robe. Now that, that's a bit confusing, that word, the train of his robe. Let me give you better English, what Isaiah is really trying to communicate. The fringes of his garment, the hem of his garment, the outer smallest pieces of his garment. What does he say? Filled the whole temple. And he ends it there. He is not able to describe him beyond the fringes of his garments. It's almost as though the, just the fringes of his garments are so glorious, so all-encompassing, that's as much as I could get. And it's almost as though Isaiah is saying, I mean the Lord is saying to Isaiah, Isaiah, you can barely see beyond the fringes of my garments that fills the center of the life of Israel, the temple, the holiest, most vast place that you know. Do not for one minute think that I am not in charge. Beloved, it cannot be a mere coincidence that in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah saw the king. Because God is trying to show Isaiah that the fate of the nation, as well as his own fate, does not finally rest in the hand of any human king, however competent and faithful that king might be. Rather, it is in the hands of the only one who is the true monarch of the universe. How encouraging was it to know that despite the crisis in the nation, God was still seated on the throne. Whereas the earthly throne was in transition, the heavenly throne was not. It reminds me of when John the Revelator went into heaven and he saw God on his throne and all he could get out was this. He who sits on the throne. Beloved, when you and I focus on the kings of the earthly thrones, it is easy to forget this truth. It is easy to think it's a particular political party that is ruling. It is easy to think that it's a particular political individual that has the reins of power. But that's only half truth. The full truth is that it is God who ultimate, ultimately reigns. You see, I really believe that it is proper that if you are here, 
and through biblical wisdom and prayer, you voted for a candidate that won, you should rejoice with thanksgiving. And I really do think that if you're here and you did vote for a candidate that lost and you did it with wisdom and biblical application and prayer, that you should feel a sense of disappointment that they lost. It is proper indeed if you're here to desire the constitutional means of resolving electoral disputes should you suspect that there were any malpractices in the process. The hope is that the one who rejoices, rejoices because he believes his candidate is best suited to move the country forward. And the one that regrets or feels a sense of, disappointed, of disappointment is disappointed because he feels that the candidate that would have best moved this, for, this country forward did not take the seat. And the one who pursues, hopefully, justice um, is because they are seeking transparency in the democratic process and the future of our country. In other words, whatever emotion you, any of us here might be experiencing, the hope is that it is because ultimately we are looking out for the good and seeking the prosperity of our nation. What is not proper, however, is this. The kind of joy and disappointment that does not take into account that irrespective of who sits on the earthly throne, the throne that really matters is occupied. Because often both the earthly kings and their subjects forget this reality. And yet what Isaiah saw is what all the prophets of scripture have quoted from time of old. Daniel chapter 2 verse 20, here is what it says. May the name of God be praised forever, for wisdom and power belongs to him. He changes the times and the season. He removes kings and establishes kings. It is God who sets up kings and dethrones them. Proverbs chapter 21 verse 1, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord and like the rivers of water, he turns it whithersoever he pleases. God has never relinquished power. All power belongs to God and all people that experience any degree of power only have it as a delegation from God. 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 11 to 12. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in the earth is thine. And yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted above all. You reign over all. He does not say you will reign sometime in the future. God is reigning now, today. And so, beloved, Whatever the tension, whatever the sense of despair, whatever the sense of elation that you might feel, let it reflect the fact that your ultimate hope lies not in a political party or a political leadership, that your ultimate hope lies in the king that sits on the throne. Because oftentimes in times like this, it is not unlikely to hear people say things like this to try and answer the question, whose side is God on? Beloved, the answer to that question is very simple and very clear in the scriptures. Is God for Kenya Kwanzaa? Or is God for Azimio? And for the others? <laughs> Let me give you the prophetic answer. Neither. None. God is not for either. And many times, especially Christians, and this is actually troubling, sometimes Christians try to Christianize political wins. And they, they try to make it look like when their team won, God won. Or when the other team lost, uh, the, therefore God has won. Or if you're here and you're feeling, because my team lost, therefore God has lost. Let me remind you, beloved, political parties are poor containers to contain the almighty, majestic, triune God. He is in no man's party. Haven't you read the scriptures? One time Joshua had been sent by God to go and take over Jericho. And they went to survey the land. And Joshua walked a bit. And the Bible says he saw God in human form. And there was God, the ancient of days. And Joshua looked at him and he drew out his sword because the man was in army regalia. 
And he drew out his sword and he said, Are you for us or against us? And the ancient of days looked at Joshua and he said, First of all, I don't like that attitude you're speaking to me with. <laughs> now don't go look for that particular phrase in the Bible. You won't find it. <laughs> but it's really what is being communicated. And then secondly, remove those your shoes. This is holy ground. When you speak to me, you don't speak to me like that. And then thirdly, get down in a worshipful state. And fourthly, to answer your question, am I for you or against you? Neither. You will not box me in your little wars. You know, when I read that, all of us thought, all of us imagined that God should have said he is for Israel, right? But he says, neither. He says, I have a purpose that I'm accomplishing in the earth now. And he told Joshua, and by the way, that sword, he says, I am the commander of the army of the Lord's hosts. He's basically telling Joshua this, right now, I have a purpose that I'm attempting, that I am actually achieving, and you are an instrument in accomplishing that purpose as far as Jericho is concerned. Don't you think for one minute that I subscribed to your party in order to destroy Jericho. And beloved, you do well to not think for a minute that God subscribed himself to Kenya Kwanzaa or God subscribed himself to Azimio. No, whatsoever, whatever purpose God has, he will accomplish it by whoever he sets on the throne. And you and I do well not to try and conscript God to our political parties, but rather to be conscripted to his. And I've always appreciated the preacher who said that Jesus did not come to take sides. He came to take over. And that remains the truth. God is on a side by himself. He says his counsel will stand and he will do all his pleasure. He has unrivaled majesty and unlimited power. Essentially, God's response to the nation's crisis in the power transition is to reveal to them through Isaiah who is really on the throne. And need I remind you that as great as Uzziah was a king, he was at best a flawed man who eventually was overtaken by pride. And he ended up living in isolation and defilement for the rest of his life. And I'm telling you, Uzziah was probably, there's David, then there's Solomon, and then there's Uzziah. He's one of the best there is. Beloved, put no hope in any political person. Put no hope. Do not be like, finally, this country. Put your hope in God. Because it is God, ultimately, who rules. So here are a couple of applications. Firstly, because God is sovereign, we don't have to be. That's such a blessing. You don't have to be sovereign. You don't have to be Lord. You don't have to sit and lose sleep over where this country is headed. You know why? Because this country is headed where God is heading it. So you don't have to worry and fret. I'm always reminded of a text um, that I think it's in 1 Corinthians. Paul says, uh, let those of you who are married be as though they were not. I wonder whether that will be addressed in the marriage seminar. <laughs> but then right after that he says, and those of you who rejoice, let them be as though they did not rejoice. And those of you who mourn, let them be as though they did not mourn. And why is Paul saying this? He says, because the time is short. Why? Because soon enough the true king will be revealed. In other words, and I think that applies in this season a lot more than in many other seasons. Are you here and you're happy and you're rejoicing that your team won? Let it be as though you did not rejoice. And are you here and you're sad and disappointed that your team lost? Let it be as though you are not disappointed. 
Because in the greater scheme of things, our hope is not in the secondary rulers that God places, but rather it is in the ultimate ruler that rules in heaven. Here's the second application. It is very possible that after someone like this, you'd be like, well, if God is sovereign and he does whatsoever he pleases, then we can eat, be merry, and just live our lives. After all, he will do whatsoever he wants. But I'd like to remind you of verse 8. The scripture says that Isaiah saw the Lord saying, who should we send and who will go for us? And as I said, send me. And it's likely that you might look at that text and wonder, why would a sovereign king who created the universe basically with a snap of his finger need to ask anybody to do anything for him? And the answer is because God has chosen in his sovereignty to use means. Not only has he sovereignly predetermined and ordained the ends, he has also sovereignly determined and ordained the means. Because here's the reality. Going forward, whoever gets, depending on whether they will go to court and whether that will happen, whoever eventually sits on that throne, he will not only influence the lives of those who voted for him. The decisions that he, make, he makes, they're going to influence everyone. Both the millions that voted for him, both the millions that didn't vote for him, and also the millions that didn't vote at all. So the question is this. Yes, we did say, for example, that God sways the heart of the king whithersoever he pleases. But here's the question. How does God do it? How does God lead the heart of the king? Well, one of the ways that he does that is through the prayers of the saints. One of the ways that he directs the heart of the king is through the prayers of the saints. It has pleased him to so do. Don't you remember in the days of Esther? The king had made a decree that whatsoever that any, all the Jews were to be slaughtered based on the bad, terrible, wicked, jealous advice of Haman. I've always said that when I've read through the scriptures, my biggest concern with leaders of state is not usually the leaders themselves. It is their team, the experts, the so-called experts that advise them. Don't look at me like that. Haven't you said things like, no, 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 uyu mutu si mbaya, ni watu, ni wale. But oftentimes it's the case. Like this particular case, it was Haman who advised the king to make that decree. And of course it had been written for all the Jews to be killed. Then Mordecai came and told Esther, Esther, we have been, we have been it has been written for us to be killed. And the Bible says, Esther didn't even know. It's, it, it always amazed me. Esther was not aware that that decree had gone forth. And she said, Bridge. she said, yes. And then Mordecai told her, by the way, do not make any mistake about it. If we die, you will not escape. And Esther said, okay, here's what we'll do. Go and tell all the Jews to go into prayer and fasting. For three days, we wear sackcloth, we pray. No eating, nothing, we are going to be praying because I'm going to be going to the presence of the king. And she knew that if you went to the presence of the king and invited, you die. He says, so I'm gonna, we are going to pray. The Bible says on the third day, on the third day of the prayer and fasting, the scripture says that the king could not sleep. He had been sleeping fine. But when God's people began to pray, the king could not sleep. He was tossing and tossing. Finally, he woke up and he said, who can give me the records? In the middle of the night, what sort of king wakes up to look at records in the middle of the night? This was God swaying his heart in the direction of the prayers of the saints. And he took the thing and he opened and he says, ah, there was a guy who did such great, wonderful things and he was never rewarded. He called Haman. He says, tell me, if somebody did a great thing for the king, what should be done for him? And Haman nicely prescribed what is to be done for his arc enemy. And eventually you know how the story goes. Here's the point I'm trying to make. God does sway the hearts of the kings that he sets in place, but he has chosen to use one of the means as the prayers of the saints. 
And you and I have to accept that whoever will eventually emerge on the throne, the decisions they make, you and I are going to either prosper or suffer on account of them. It is sad that I've looked at social media and a lot of people, I've seen quite a lot of people saying stuff like, you know what, I just want this country to burn and burn. In fact, so that these people, they, they will learn to vote wisely. Let me tell you, if this country burns and burns, there will be no people to learn to vote wisely. If the country burns, we will burn with it. Haven't you read the scriptures? He says, pray for the country where I have placed you, for in their prosperity, therefore you also will prosper. If we get a president, whoever it is, if he leads this country to the gutters, you and I to the gutters with it. If he leads it to prosperity, you and I to prosperity with it. God has called you and I to sway the heart of the king through prayers. And we must take up the responsibility to pray for whoever comes in power. No wonder the scripture says, let prayers be made for all in authority that we might live a peaceable and quiet life in all godliness. Our peaceable life and quietness and godliness is tied to the prayers that we make concerning the king in the land, irrespective of who that king is. And so here's the application. Pray for whoever will get in power, whether you voted for him or not, is inconsequential. But pray that God will sway their hearts. That if somebody with ill intention will take up the seat, that God will prevail against ill intention. And if somebody with good intention will take up the seat, that God will cause their good intention to prosper. This is the role of those that God has called to pray for the nation. And lastly, Isaiah tells us that in the year that King Uzziah died, King Uzziah was really terminally ill. I'd like to poise this question. If Uzziah, as great a king as he was, was imperfect, and it should remind you and I never to put our hope in whatever king comes on the throne. Our hope rather should be in God. So that whoever mourns should be as one who really did not mourn. And whoever rejoices should be as one who really did not rejoice. Because what Isaiah discovered in this time of crisis, in as much as whoever was the next king, in this case it was Jotham, who came in and his, he had his manifesto and he was going to do different things and he was going to change the cabinet and, and do all these kinds of things. Uzziah saw in the throne of heaven, there was no transition in heaven. God's purpose remained the same. And whoever was going to assume the throne, Isaiah could take comfort and courage in the fact that all they could do is accomplish the purpose of the true monarch of the universe who sits on the throne. This is the comfort of all God's people. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Thank you.